Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and for inviting me to speak here today. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about post-processing of MRIs and in particular in relation to rare dementia diseases. So we know that um, it's estimated that 5 to 8 percent of people over the age of 60 have uh, dementia. And we know that Western nations are aging. And if we look at the graph here on the right, we see a prediction of the number of people uh, who are going to be over the age of 60 over the next 30 years. Um, if we are lucky to get to the age of 80, our chances of getting dementia are, are increased. And, and at the age of 85, it's thought that 25 to 50 percent of people have symptoms of dementia. So with our ever-aging populations, uh, dementia will probably be uh, most of the biggest threats to public health in the 21st century. Now, if nothing changes, we might be headed into a massive uh, societal crisis. You see here on the right, there's a, an estimate of the number of people living with dementia over the next 30 years. And what's going to happen is we're going to have a numerous people with dementia. We're going to need more and more people taking care of these people. Dementia is the major cause of dependencies and disabilities in, in older people. And uh, the only way out of this crisis is really to develop treatments. But uh, developing treatments is, is very challenging uh, and it's, it's difficult. And, and the reason is that, uh, one of the reasons is that we cannot really diagnose these diseases correctly and we cannot really di diagnose them early enough. And one of the main reasons for that is there are so many causes of dementia. But uh, at early stages, the symptoms are very similar. And with the current um, clinical diagnostic approaches, it's very difficult to differentiate between different causes of dementia at early stages. So, and we, we almost have no treatments to dementia, as we all know. And early diagnosis is one of the keys to possible treatment strategies. So what we really need to do is we need to find some novel ways to, to diagnose these diseases earlier so we can robustly select patients for clinical trials. And only then investigators can start identifying meaningful therapeutic targets for drug development and also to identify the right group of people for, for clinical trials. We need to be able to, to find the right uh, you know, the, the, a group of people with the same cause of dementia to, to the, for this to be successful. So this is a, a, a big major problem, as we all know, in here. And how are we going to solve this? Well, we don't know yet. But in my mind, medical imaging is going to play a huge, role in, reaching, huge, huge uh, role in reaching that goal. Now, we're living at a time where a, a, a huge amount of clinical healthcare data is being collected. And at the same time, computer power is reaching new, new heights almost every year. So we are living at a very exciting time. And in my research group, we are developing image processing strategies to extract new data from already available clinical imaging data to help us get a better understanding of the brain and, and brain diseases. Um, we know that uh, neurodegenerative diseases can cause structural changes in the brain. And at early stages, these changes can be very subtle and, and difficult to, to see and pick up for radiologists who are just looking through um, slices, 2D images of the brain. And we know, of course, the brain is a 3D structure, but the radiologists are looking through the brain uh, slice by slice in 2D and try to identify these changes that have been associated with these diseases. Now, just to uh, give you some examples and, and mention um, examples of this kind of changes that are taking place in the brain, uh, one example is atrophy in the brainstem. Now, the brainstem is a very um, understudied structure deep in the, in the brain. Uh, as you know, and, and in, a, in patients with uh, a, a, a Parkinson plus syndrome called uh, progressive supranormal palsy or PSP, what happens in the brain that is that the, the, um, the midbrain, which is the top part of the, do we have a, a pointer? Or, oops, no, oh, here we go. 
So we have a, um, in the midbrain, which is the top part of the brainstem, so patients with PSP have atrophy in the midbrain, while the pons, which is the next kind of uh, substructure of the brainstem, tends to be preserved. So the midbrain starts to um, kind of form uh, a, a sort of like a, a beak, and then it, it starts to, the, the brainstem starts to resemble a hummingbird. And this is the sign that radiologists look for when they are looking at uh, brain scans of Parkinson of uh, PSP patients, and here we have two images taking nine years apart uh, for PSP uh, patient, and you can see that you can—I mean—you can identify it on the uh, image from 2016, uh, but it's very difficult to pick this up early uh, in the disease. Another example, a little bit more extreme, in this case here on this figure is uh, this is a, a late-stage patient with normal pressure hydrocephalus, which, which is another rare uh, dementia uh, disease. Uh, this is a late stage, like I said, but at early stages, the, the changes are very, can be very subtle. And the symptoms of this, this disease are very highly overlapping with Alzheimer's disease. So at early stages, a lot of these patients are misdiagnosed with Alzheimer's. And what make it, makes it even more challenging is that, you know, like you saw, saw in, in uh, Paul's talk uh, earlier, I mean, the, the, the ventricles in Alzheimer's disease also, and, uh, you know, get enlarged. So at early stages with these two diseases, they are very, very similar. But for NPH, uh, studies have shown that uh, there is some disproportionate dilation of the ventricular system. And of course, the, the cause of the ventricular dilation is different in Alzheimer's than in NPH. In NPH, we have this accumulation of fluid in the, in the ventricles, but in, in, in Alzheimer's, we have more of atrophy that is taking place all over the brain. So we want to, uh, our research goal is really to develop some uh, image processing uh, methods that can help us quantify these structures and quantify them earlier than currently possible. We want to develop methods that are specific to these diseases uh, to better characterize these, these diseases, like this dispor disproportionate dilation of the ventricular system in NPH, but also this midbrain atrophy uh, in, in Parkinson plus diseases, where we have the, the midbrain shrinking, but the, the pons is preserved. So we, we want to be able to quantify these changes in a more accurate way so we can uh, hopefully uh, pick up these, these changes earlier than currently possible. Um, so we know that, uh, you, and, and, uh, you know that there are multiple segmentation methods out there for, for whole brain segmentation, uh, both classical computer vision methods and also uh, AI-based methods. And often these methods are developed and tested on healthy brains, and brains that maybe deviate, deviate very slightly from healthy brains. But what happens is that when you take some of these methods and apply them to brains with pathology and, and e extreme cases like severe ventriculomegaly in, in NPH patients, these methods tend to, tend to fail. And here's an example of an NPH patient. Um, one of these methods is FreeSurfer, which is this very powerful and widely used method uh, for brain image segmentation. But for these cases, FreeSurfer uh, often fails. Another example is the brainstem. So, FreeSurfer actually uh, being this very, uh, you know, like I said, powerful and, and great segmentation method that works almost in, in, you know, in every case. But if you look at the brainstem, uh, FreeSurfer actually is the only publicly available method that does a parcellation of the brainstem. But it also tends to fail in some cases for the brainstem. And what, what also happens is that uh, so for, for you to segment the brainstem using FreeSurfer, you, you first do the whole brain segmentation, and which is shown here, uh, the second, do I have a point here, here? Yeah. So here, this is the whole brain segmentation from FreeSurfer, uh, giving us a segmentation of the, of the brainstem as, as one object or one structure. But then you go into the second module of FreeSurfer to get the parcellation of the brainstem and that turns out to be very inconsistent with the whole brain segmentation. Uh, and also, some, in some cases, and many cases, the accuracy of the brain segmentation is not that good. And here we're, we have the manual segmentation 
in comparison. And then even in some cases, the uh, brainstem segmentation completely fails, like in this case. Um, and all the drawback of these methods, like these, this, this, these classical segmentation methods, is that they have a very long processing time uh, for a free surfer. And then I'm talking about you know, running these methods on a, on a desktop computers with, with CPUs, not you know, powerful clusters like Morris has. It takes around nine to or 10 to 15 hours to process a single scan, which could limit its use in, 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 long stu in, in, in large studies, but maybe doesn't when we're using clusters, but limits its use in, in clinical settings at least. So um, in recent years, uh, as we all know, various methods have been proposed uh, using deep convolutional neural networks uh, to tackle the image segmentation um, problem. And we know that the UNET is a well-known scene and architecture uh, that has been very you know, successfully and widely used in medical image analysis. Now, deep learning methods generally need uh, numerous labeled images for supervised training. Uh, and for brain segmentation, manual segmentation is still the, the gold standard for, for brain segmentation. And such data is not often available or, or not feasible to generate. It's very tedious and time consuming to, to manually annotate uh, brain images. Um, and you need experts to do this. So this is not, often not possible to do. So in our research, what uh, we've done is that to, to kind of address these challenges is that we have developed a, a variation of the three-dimensional unit uh, to, uh, to uh, segment these structures, and we use automatically generated uh, training data. Uh, a few years back, we developed a, a kind of a, a classical image processing method uh, using multi-atlas segmentation. To segment the, the ventricle, to segment well multiple structures in the brain, but in particular we focused on the ventricular system in relation to NPH patients, but also then uh, uh, adapted that method later on to be able to parcelate the brainstem as well. So we use this method; um, it's it's quite accurate, and we use this to automatically generate our training data, and then we extract the structures that we are interested in, feed that into our deep network to get a, an automatic segmentation of the brain. So here, uh, we're taking this poor uh, delineator out of the picture and, and generating these, these uh, training data automatically. So we've done this for, yeah, so uh, by doing this, we only need around 50 segmented subjects for our training sample. Uh, so, so we don't always need a huge amount of data to be able to successfully, uh, you know, tr train a deep learning model to get get some fast and fully automated segmentations. Now we've done this for the ventricular system and we've done this for the brainstem, uh, and been able to get highly accurate and, and really fast segmentation results in a matter of seconds, and this uh, gives us the 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 opportunities to, to quantify these two structures, to quantify hopefully the, this atrophy or this atrophy taking place in the brainstem, but also the enlargement that is taking place in the ventricular system. And of course, this also gives us a, a 3D view of these different structures. Now, just to show you briefly some results, here we have a segmentation results from the ventricle segmentation uh, network. We call it v, VPARnet, and we are showing, I'm showing here on the right, this is a manual segmentation, and here we have the results from our network, and comparing it with uh, some state-of-the-art segmentation methods that are available out there. Uh, here we have two cases of NPAs with mild ventriculomegaly, and all, all methods work really well on, on these cases, but then when we apply this to more severe cases of ventriculomegaly, uh, these other methods start to fail, while our method is, is quite accurate and, and very close to the manual segmentation. Now here, I'm not going to go through this, but just some quantitative uh, comparisons and evaluations of the method, uh, showing that our method is, is significantly more accurate on all the substructures of the ventricular system compared to the other methods, and in particular for NPH subjects. All methods are very similar for healthy subjects, but then for the NPH subjects, these, these um, other methods start to fail. Same here with the dice similarity coefficient, uh, significantly more accurate. 
uh, our, our method is, is significantly more accurate on the NPH subjects in, in particular, and, and, and a bit all, but similar for healthy controls. Now, in terms of time, um, this, given that there is a, it's a deep learning method, it, it produces results in a matter of minutes, and this is showing just a comparison on a regular desktop computer using a regular CPU unit, and there we can uh, produce segmentation results in two minutes. Now, for the brainstem, like I said, uh, FreeSurfer is the only publicly available method that can parcelate the brainstem into these substructures. So we are comparing here against brainstem. Uh, FreeSurfer, uh, this is the result from our network compared to the manual segmentation, and FreeSurfer tends to have some, uh, sub, uh, some uh, errors that are causing the, the accuracy to be a little bit less uh, than, than, the, than the manual segmentation uh, shown here. Uh, and also quantitative evaluations of our network. We, we, we did some uh, evaluations on two different data sets, uh, neuromorphometrics and ADNI. And I'm showing here the dye similarity coefficient for different substructures of the, of the brainstem. We see here for the pons, for the midbrain, for the uh, medulla, and then this, this little tiny structure, cerebral, uh, superior cerebellar peduncles. Uh, which, so this is a very, this is very promising results uh, with high dice coefficient. Uh, and then just to summarize uh, some ongoing work and future work that we're working on, uh, we're performing some extensive evaluations of these, these methods on clinical data. At Johns Hopkins, there's an ongoing study, um, uh, retrospective study on NPH patients that is led by uh, Jerry Prince at Johns Hopkins. Here in Iceland, uh, we're focusing on the Parkinson Plus syndromes, looking into uh, patients with PSP and MSA and looking at these structural changes in the brainstem and other structures that have been shown to be associated with Parkinson Plus syndromes. And we want to see if we can, we can do some analysis of the atrophy seen in the brainstem and other structures in relation to disease diagnosis. But just some potential benefits of, of imaging biomarkers like this. Uh, this could potentially and hopefully lead to more accurate and earlier diagnosis. We're, we are try hoping that we can pick up these changes earlier than currently possible by, by designing these methods specifically for these uh, rare diseases to be able to, to pick up this uh, change um, more robustly. And hopefully this will then eventually uh, help us find uh, the pathogenesis for the disease earlier. That is the key to, to treatment development. And here's my research team and, and collaborators and funding um, information. Thank you. Thank you very much. coffee is still out there so we still have time for one question but then the main remaining question I would like to push to the coffee break but we have time for one hi so you mentioned um, that your uh, method um, for segmentation uh, seemed to do well in patients who were uh, progressing in pathology and so one of the, the continuing issues that, that we always have with our research is that any of these automated, automated segmentation methods always tend to break down as people move further along into the disease. And so that uh, introduces systemic bias into your system. So can you talk about your thoughts on creating training schemas for these automated segmentation systems that address that um, and how we can try to reduce that wherever we can? Right. So I think it's very important. It's a great question. It's something that we've given a, a lot of thought, and it's 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 important that you have, I, in my mind, that you can develop a method that can be used for all these stages. You know, you don't need a specific method for, for example, the healthy controls, obviously, and then a different method for the pathology. You need to, a method that is able to to segment um, from healthy subjects to the severe pathology. And what we've done in our case, for example, for the NPH cases, because then we have a huge variability in ventricle sizes. So we are training our model on subjects that kind of, uh, you know, cover the, the uh, you know, uh, range of ventricle sizes that we want our method to be able to find. And also, we're, so we're training on healthy controls and patients with severe ventriculomegaly. 
And we're also training on data with, from different scanners and, and sometimes different sequences like SPTR versus MP rates. So, because you know, when you train your model on a single, you know, on a very uniform uh, training set and apply it to a, to a different training set, that, that's not going to work well. So that's kind of ha has been our take on it to try to have a very uh, you know, rich training set, even though we have a small number of subjects, but we try to kind of uh, cover this so we can, and that, that has turned out well in our case.